Hello there. Hello, Evelyn. Hello, uh, Kelly. I saw your name. And Pauline saw your name and then lots of other names. Welcome. My name's Gilbert. And this is Fireside Reading. And I sit in front of the fire every day at 5 Pacific. And I read a chapter of a book to people who might like to join me. And you're joining me today. And I'm so grateful for your company. I love doing this, and I, I love that so many people enjoy it too. I do upload chapters to the YouTube channel Fireside Reading, where you can watch and listen to all the books we've done together. Um, I'm a little slow on uploading uh, this particular book, A Passage to India, but it will get up there. At the moment, you have to go to Instagram to watch the chapters as they come along. They are all up on Instagram too. Um, I've had a little bit of a cold these last couple of days and things are getting better. I hope I don't have another attack of uh, the cough as we proceed with this very interesting book. Welcome to a fireside reading of A Passage to India by E.M. Forster. Chapter 34. Dr. Aziz left the palace at the same time. As he returned to his house, which stood in a pleasant garden further up the main street of the town, he could see his old patron paddling and capering in the slush ahead. Hello, he called, and it was the wrong remark for the devotee indicated by circular gestures of his arms that he did not desire to be disturbed. He added, sorry, which was right, for Godbole twisted his head till it didn't belong to his body and said in a strained voice that had no connection with his mind, he arrived at the European guest house, perhaps, at least possibly. Did he? Since when? But time was too definite. He waved his arm more dimly and disappeared. Aziz knew who he was, Fielding. But he refused to think about him because it disturbed his life, and he still trusted the floods to prevent him from arriving. A fine little river issued from his garden gate and gave him much hope. It was impossible that anyone could get across the Diora in such weather as this. Fielding's visit was official. He had been transferred from Chandrapur and sent on a tour through central India to see what the remoter states were doing with regard to English education. He had married. He had done the expected with Miss Quested, and Aziz had no wish to see him again. Dear old Godbule, he thought and smiled. He had no religious curiosity and had never discovered the meaning of this annual antic, but he was well assured that Godbole was a dear old man. He had come to Mao through him and remained on his account. Without him, he could never have grasped problems so totally different from those of Chandrapur. For here, the cleavage was between Brahman and non-Brahman. Muslims and English were quite out of the running and sometimes not mentioned for days. Since Godbole was a Brahman, Aziz was one also for purposes of intrigue. They would often joke about it together. The fissures in the Indian soil are infinite. Hinduism, so solid from a distance, is riven into sects and clans which radiate and join and change their names according to the aspect from which they are approached. Study it for years with the best teachers and when you raise your head, nothing they have told you quite fits. 
Aziz, the day of his inauguration, had remarked, I study nothing, I respect, making an excellent impression. There was now a minimum of prejudice against him. Nominally, under a Hindu doctor, he was really chief medicine man to the court. He had to drop. <coughs> he had to drop inoculation and such Western whims. But even at Chandrapur, his profession had been again centering round the operating table, and here in the backwoods, he let his instruments rust, ran his little hospital at half steam, and caused no undue alarm. His impulse to escape from the English was sound. They had frightened him permanently, and there are only two reactions against fright. To kick and scream on committees, or to retreat to a or to retreat to a or to retreat to a remote jungle where the Saib seldom comes. His old lawyer friends wanted him to stop in British India and help agitate and might have prevailed but for the treachery of Fielding. The news had not surprised him in the least. A rift had opened between them after the trial when Cyril had not joined in his procession. Those advocacies of the girl had increased it. Then came the postcards from Venice, so cold, so unfriendly, that all agreed that something was wrong. And finally, after a silence, the expected letter from Hampstead. Mahmud Ali was with him at the time. Some news that uh, will surprise you. I am to marry someone whom you know. He did not read further. Here it comes. Answer for me. And he threw it to Mahmoud Ali. Subsequent letters he destroyed unopened. It was the end of a foolish experiment. And though sometimes at the back of his mind he felt that Fielding had made sacrifices for him, it was now all confused with his genuine hatred of the English. I am an Indian at last, he thought, standing motionless in the rain. Life passed pleasantly. The climate was healthy, so that the children could be with him all the year round, and he had married again, uh, so that the children could be with him all the year round, and he had married again. Not exactly a marriage, but he liked to regard it as one. And he read his Persian, wrote his poetry, had his horse, and sometimes got some shikar while the good Hindus looked the other way. His poems were all on one topic, oriental womanhood. The purda must go, was their burden, otherwise we shall never be free. And he declared, fantastically, that India would not have been conquered if women as well as men had fought at Plassey. But we do not show our women to the foreigner, not explaining how this was to be managed, for he was writing a poem. Bulbuls and roses would still persist. The pathos of defeated Islam remained in his blood and could not be expelled by modernities. Illogical poems, like their writer. Yet they struck a true note. There cannot be a motherland without new homes. In one poem, the only one funny old god Bole liked, he had skipped over the motherland, whom he did not truly love, and gone straight to internationality. Ah, that is Bhakti. Ah, my young friend. That is different and very good. Ah, India, who seems not to move, will go straight there while the other nations waste their time. May I translate this particular one into Hindi? In fact, it might be rendered into Sanskrit also, it is so enlightened. Yes, of course. All your other poems are very good, too. His Highness was saying to Colonel Maggs last time he came that we are proud of you, simpering slightly. 
Colonel Maggs was the political agent for the neighborhood and Aziz's dejected opponent. The criminal investigation department kept an eye on Aziz ever since the trial. They had nothing actionable against him, but Indians who have been unfortunate must be watched and to the end of his life he remained under observation, thanks to Miss Quested's mistake. Colonel Maggs learnt with concern that a suspect was coming to Mao and, adopting a playful manner, rallied the old Raja for permitting a Muslim doctor to approach his sacred person. A few years ago, the Raja would have taken the hint for the political agent then had been a formidable figure, descending with all the thunders of empire when it was most inconvenient, turning the polity inside out, requiring motor cars and tiger hunts, trees cut down that impeded the view from the guest house, cows milked in his presence, and generally arrogating the control of internal affairs. But there had been a change of policy in high quarters, Local funders were no longer endorsed, and the group of little states that composed the agency discovered this and began comparing notes with fruitful result. To see how much or how little Colonel Maggs would stand became an agreeable game at Mao, which was played by all the departments of state. He had to, he had to stand the appointment of Dr. Aziz, the Raja did not take the hint, but replied that Hindus were less exclusive than formerly, thanks to the enlightened commands of the Viceroy, and he felt it his duty to move with the times. Yes, all had gone well hitherto, but now, when the rest of the state was plunged in its festival, he had a crisis of a very different sort. A note awaited him at his house. There was no doubt that Fielding had arrived overnight, nor much doubt that Godbole knew of his arrival, for the note was addressed to him, and he had read it before sending it on to Aziz, and had written in the margin, Is not this delightful news? But unfortunately my religious duties prevent me from taking any action. Fielding announced that he had inspected Mud Cool, Miss Derrick's former preserve, that he had nearly been drowned at Diora, that he had reached Mao according to timetable and hoped to remain there two days, studying the various educational innovations of his old friend. <coughs> Excuse me. Studying the various educational innovations of his old friend. Nor had he come alone. His wife and her brother accompanied him. And then the note turned into the sort of note that always did arrive from the state guest house wanting something. No eggs, mosquito nets torn. When would they pay their respects to his highness? Was it correct that a torchlight procession would take place? If so, might they view it? They didn't want to get, give trouble, but if they might stand in a balcony or if they might go out in a boat. Aziz tore the note up. He had had enough of showing misquested native life, treacherous, hideous Harridan bad people altogether. He hoped to avoid them, though this might be difficult, for they would certainly be held up for several days at Mao. Down country, the floods were even worse, and the pale gray faces of lakes had appeared in the direction of the Azigar railway station. Thanks all so much for joining me. Sorry about the cough. I think it's getting a little bit better every time. Uh, but um, hopefully it'll be gone soon. We have about five more days on this book and then the next one. 
to be. Uh, I'll tell you what it's going to be in the next couple of days. Uh, but until I see you all again, everyone, please stay very, very well.